invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, we've been hearing those words uh, now for six weeks or so, and Pastor Jeff has been encouraging us as a church family to try to memorize those verses from the great book of Colossians in the New Testament. So this morning, as we wrap up, I want to see how we're all doing. So I'm going to put the verses on the screen and lead you through a sort of fill in the blanks, see how you're doing, all right? You ready to go with me? Just fill in the words as we get to the space. He is the image of of the invisible God, nice, you can see how it goes, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, somebody said it over here, nice, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, some of you aren't even moving your lips, so move your lips so, so I can think you're memorizing it, okay, all things were created through him. And for him. I always want to say by him too, but it's through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So I'm going to give a report to Jeff. <laughs> but if memorizing is hard for you, uh, the only things you need to remember from these verses really are he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Well, like many of you, I have a regular exercise routine. Uh, I belong to the Delnor Fitness Center right over here near uh, this campus, and I go four or five times a week to work out. I ride a stationary bike, I sometimes get on the elliptical, lift a few weights, hit the steam room, and I'm done. And I've done this for years. I find it uh, gives me more energy, I sleep better, I, I'm more effective in my work. You could say I'm devoted to my exercise routine. So every day, I pack my uh, little workout bag with what I need for that day. I got my shoes in here. I have my uh, shirt, my socks, all the uh, the earbuds to watch my favorite TV show while I'm riding and stuff like that. So I have everything I need, normal stuff. Well, one day last week, I got to the center and uh, was kind of in a hurry. You know, I gave myself an hour to do, do, do the workout thing and then get back to whatever I was working on that day. So I get dressed and I'm all ready to go, almost all set to hit the workout floor and I realized I forgot one item. I didn't have my workout shorts. <laughs> Had everything else, didn't have my shorts. And the first thing I thought to myself was, well, this is gonna be awkward. <laughs> Actually, I just realized, you know, I, I, need, I just got back dressed in my regular clothes and went home because I didn't have my shorts and I couldn't do what I went there to do. Uh, We're in the final week of our series from Colossians. Uh, We've been studying this for six weeks now, and it's called All Things. And Paul, in this beautiful letter, has been equipping these Colossian believers with everything they need to live out their faith in what what was really a hostile world. And he says everything begins with Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. In Jesus, the wisdom and mystery of God has been made known. We don't have to wonder anymore what God is like. More than that, Jesus has canceled the debt of our sin, canceled it by nailing it to the cross. And more even than that, Jesus not only gives us new hearts through the forgiveness for our sins, but he's given us a new identity. That is, we are no longer identified by our culture, by our race, by our education, by our wealth, by our success, even by our failures and our sin. We're now identified as the children of God, chosen, adopted, loved, made new. And because we are identified with Christ, he says, we can put off the old self, put off all the old ways we thought about ourselves, all the old ways we behaved, and put on a new self that comes from Christ himself, full of compassion and kindness and patience and forgiveness 
and love. And then last week we saw how our new identity then shapes the central relationships of our lives, where we really live in marriage between husbands and wives, in families between parents and children, in work between masters and servants. And today Paul wraps up this letter just before he gives all the personal greetings by just giving two last bits of instruction. So this, this we're going to read today, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Just watch on the screens or look in your Bibles as I read. Paul writes, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Going to stop there. Two things he says today. He's encouraging these young Colossians and us as well to pray on purpose and to live on mission. First, pray on purpose. I mentioned, uh, I've mentioned here many times over the years that I grew up in the church. Many of you grew up in the church as well, but I literally grew up for a time in the church. Uh, for a time between when I was 10 and 12 years old, my dad was pastor of a small church in New York, and we actually lived as a family in a wing of the church building. It was like we lived over on that side of this building in, in the cornerstone room, and then right here was the sanctuary, just separated by a small hallway in my dad's office, which meant my brother and I had a huge area to play and we could play in the church basement we could play places because uh usually the church was empty except for sundays and wednesday nights well on wednesday night uh, my dad's church has always had prayer meetings and my parents would always go to that prayer meeting leaving uh us two young boys at home sometimes with a sitter sometimes on our own because we were just right across you know a small hallway so they would leave us um and we discovered in our little living quarters upstairs there was a closet that the floor of the closet was directly over the sanctuary of the church. So like right up there would, would have been the closet in our living quarters. And furthermore, we discovered uh, that the floor of the closet had little knot holes in it through which we could peer and we could see down into the sanctuary. And this was a source of endless entertainment for us on Wednesday nights. We would climb in that closet. We, would just, we, we could spy on the people in prayer meeting. And then... One day, we got, night, we got the idea uh, that uh, we started to roll up little tiny, tiny wads of paper, <laughs> and we, could, we, were, we were trying to, we were dropping them through these holes, trying to land them on the, on, on the hair of the church ladies kneeling in the pews to pray. <laughs> Never even dawned on us that it wouldn't be real hard to trace who was doing that, because <laughs> everybody knew the coffee boys lived, up, lived over there, uh, and I don't remember all the details about when my dad eventually discovered what we had been doing, but I do remember that my brother and I had our own little prayer meeting at that time. <laughs> Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. Another translation says, continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, Paul has already told the Colossians that he prays for them, and he's told them, exactly what he prays for them and why. Let me read these for you. We covered this a few weeks ago. Well, way back in chapter 1, the apostle writes to them, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now, notice the words I've put in red here. This is what he prays and why. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. For this reason, verse 9, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power through his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. In chapter 2, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who have not met me personally. So Paul's prayer for the Colossians was very purposeful. He prayed specifically that these Colossians would grow in their knowledge of God, that they would live lives worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit. In other words, you could say he was praying that they would experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where they were, which is part of why we say those words most every week here at Chapel Street. 
And more even than that, he says he's contending for them. That word means to fight for someone, to stand up for them. And that's how Paul prays for the Colossians. Now, if you're a parent, uh, you understand, I think, just instinctively this kind of prayer. Because when you pray for your kids, you contend for them. Uh, You never forget to pray for your children. You don't stop praying for your children. It's just how we're wired. Now, he asked them to contend for him. Imagine what this would have felt like for the Colossian believers. This is the great apostle Paul uh, who's asking them if they would pray for him. It's a powerful thing. And he wants them to pray on purpose. So he says, devote yourselves to prayer. Continue steadfastly. Don't give up. Keep at it. Now, why does he say it this way? Well, I think because Paul knows that prayer is central to spiritual life. Prayer is how we grow in the knowledge of God. You hear things here when we speak and teach on Sunday mornings. But you grow when you ruminate on those things and meditate on those things and pray about those things and drive them from your mind down into your life. Prayer is how we experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. Prayer is how we access the very power of God. Prayer is one of the ways we love and care for each other. And Paul knows this, but he also knows that prayer can be hard. He knows prayer can be discouraging. He knows that often we wonder if our prayer is even effective at all. He knows that prayer is often one of the first things we lay aside. I like to think of prayer kind of like a cell phone. Uh, Now, I have no idea. Some of you know how these things work. I have no idea how this technology works. I have no idea how I can type in a few characters, hit send, and my son, who right now is in Australia, in a matter of seconds can read what I sent him. I have no idea how that works. It, it, It travels at the speed of light and it bounces back and it's amazing to me. I have no idea how it works but I don't have to understand how it works to use it. And sometimes I don't get a connection right away. Sometimes it doesn't seem to go through. Sometimes the message bounces back, but I don't stop using it. And my guess is neither do you. See, prayer is like the technology of God. Paul says, keep using it. Don't give up. And then he talks about how we are to pray. He says, by being watchful and thankful. Now, the word watchful here means uh, be alert, Be vigilant. Literally, it means stay awake. Well, alert for what? Now, if we look at other places in the New Testament where the same word is used, we see what he means. Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 says, be on your guard, same word, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. So there he's talking about uh, being alert to threats to your faith. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter writes, be alert, same word, and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. He's talking about being alert to the attacks of the enemy. See, Paul knows that the Colossians are surrounded uh, by challenges to their faith. There were the Gnostic philosophers, which we've talked about. There were pagan superstitions, which we've talked about. He's telling them to be alert in prayer, to the spiritual battle happening all around them. Now, I want to stop here just for a moment. To me, it's as if the Apostle Paul, 2,000 years ago, in a much different culture, is writing directly to us today, especially to our younger people. So if you are in middle school or high school today, or maybe you're a college student, maybe you're just getting ready to go to college, let me say something to you that I think Paul is talking about. That is, unless you go to a gospel-centered college or university, if you go to a major university in America, a secular state university, there's a really good chance, in fact, it's almost certain, that you are going to be told from the moment you set foot on that campus, in a thousand different ways, that everything you've learned about God about faith, about the Bible, about salvation, about spiritual truth is wrong. From the moment you set foot on campus, you are going to be told that you must accept what I would call the cultural equivalent of spiritual correctness. You are going to be told that God, your idea of God is not necessary for faith. Just believe in yourself. 
Put your faith in yourself. You're going to be told that all religions are essentially the same thing, that they all get to the same place. The important part is find your truth. You're going to be told that what matters is you creating your own identity. From the moment you step foot on campus, that's what you're going to be told. Paul's saying, watch out. Stay awake. Be alert. And prayer is one of the ways we stay alert to the challenges all around us in our culture. And then he says, be thankful. Now, this is a hallmark of Paul's teaching on prayer. Almost every time he mentions prayer in the New Testament, he says to pray with thanksgiving. For example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, remember, what are Paul's circumstances as he writes the letter to the Colossians? You remember? Paul is actually in prison in Rome, likely chained to a Roman guard by ankles or his wrists, waiting trial before the emperor, a trial that will likely be the end of his earthly life. Not a whole lot to be thankful for, the way we usually think of being thankful. The people he's writing to in this small church in Colossae are embedded in a hostile culture. So it makes sense that Paul would say, be alert, watch out. But now he says, be thankful. Thankful for what exactly? Now notice, he's not talking here about material things. Now, is it, is it okay and appropriate to be thankful for material things? Absolutely, sure. We should be thankful for our material things. But Paul's got nothing here. He's in chains. So what's he being thankful for? What's he been talking about in this letter? He's thankful that through Jesus, the mystery of God has been made known. He's thankful that through Jesus, we have the hope of glory. That's heaven, eternal life. That through Jesus, we have new identity in Christ. That he's the one who changes who we are and how we live. And no matter what our circumstances, he says, those are truths that we can be thankful for. And then he tells them what he wants them to pray for. Notice verse 3. And pray for us too that God may open a door so that I can get out of this prison. No, uh, he doesn't say that. Open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Well, way back in my student ministry days years ago, I used to lead a high school Bible study group on Wednesday nights, and we'd have 40 or 50 students gathered in a community center we used to rent, and um, We'd have some small groups, I'd teach some, and at the end, we'd always have a little time of prayer, and I'd have the students give me anything they wanted me to pray for. And it would be usually things like, you know, a sick grandma, or I have a test next week, or something like that. And, but one night, uh, a, bra a kid who was there, I think for the first time, raised his hand. It was really unusual, because usually new kids didn't share a prayer uh, concern. So I said, yeah, what do you got? And he said, um, yeah, uh, like, could you... Uh, Pray that I won't get grounded. It's like, hmm, might be a story there. So I said, do you mind, uh, mind, thanks for sharing, but can you tell me a little bit more? And he did. He said, well, uh, the day before, he and a buddy had uh, stayed out late at night past their parents' curfew. And that since they realized it was already too late to go home, to go home their parents would be upset. They just stayed out all night. <laughs> then went to school the next day, that day, Wednesday. And stayed in school all day, then stayed out after school as well, avoiding going home. Then he came straight to our Bible study, invited by a friend, and he was going to go home after that. And he knew his parents would be upset, so I, could I please pray that he wouldn't get grounded? <laughs> so I said, thanks, for, uh, thanks again for the detail, um, but I don't think I can pray for that. And the whole room got really quiet, like, what? I said, I don't think I can pray for that. Here's what I think I can pray. I'll pray that you'll have the humility and the courage to go home tonight to apologize to your parents for disregarding and disrespecting them, disregarding their boundaries, and that you'll uh, accept any, uh, any discipline that they see, they th think fits uh, what you did. I'll, I can pray for that. Would it be okay? And he went, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so many of our prayers are like that, aren't they? We pray for ourselves and our circumstances, sometimes to get out of the trouble that we kind of created for ourselves. We pray for our needs, our problems. Now, should we pray for our circumstances about them? Yes, it's absolutely appropriate to, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. That's not what he's asking them to pray for. He's asking the Colossians to pray on purpose and for purpose and pray for us too. And by the way, you may be wondering who the us is. 
Uh, if you keep reading Colossians, as some of you have to the very end, uh, Paul mentions a whole bunch of names. These are men who were either in prison with him for their faith or who were serving and helping him as he was in prison. Names like Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Justice, Epaphras, who was the pastor, founding pastor of the church in Colossae. Even Luke, yeah, that Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts was there as a doctor attending to Paul's needs. So Paul had a community around him there in Rome. He says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray on purpose. Pray for this purpose, that a door would be open to proclaim the mystery. Now, what's the mystery? The mystery is what the Gnostic philosophers love to talk about, the mystery of spiritual things that only was available to the very most intellectually elite. Paul says, no, 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 the mystery has been made known. The mystery is salvation through Jesus available to everyone, including the Gentiles. It's the gospel. Now, who were, who, what's the open door? Who, who were the particular Gentiles Paul was concerned about? Okay, he's in prison in Rome, chained likely 24 hours a day to a Roman guard. I think he's thinking about those guards. Can you imagine being one of those Roman guards? You're chained to the Apostle Paul for eight hours at a time. Can you imagine him in their little workroom between shifts? I can't believe this guy. He won't stop talking about Jesus. He wants this Jesus guy. I think we're going to meet some of those guys in heaven, some of those Roman guards. I think he's thinking about the Roman officials and authority. I think he might be thinking about the Roman emperor himself. Pray that I'll have an opportunity, not to get out of these chains, but to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Because that's why I'm here. Pray on purpose, he says. Secondly, as he wraps this letter up, he says, live on mission. Pray on purpose and live on mission. Let me try to explain what I mean. Uh, my dad, uh, I've said before, is a retired pastor, and he's made a lifelong habit of memorizing Scripture. And we, we've worked on a couple of verses, but my dad loves to do that, and he's really good at memorizing. He's got a great mind for that. And uh, at one point in his life, he had memorized over 100 chapters of the Bible. Not verses, chapters of the Bible. And he liked to have the opportunity to demonstrate this gift anytime you gave him an opening. And it would drive us sort of crazy. You know, uh, hey, let me share what I've been memorizing. Oh, I need like, you know, because he, he, could, he could go for like a half an hour on stuff that he'd memorized. And then, so during the holiday season years ago, he was in a department store somewhere, and the checkout line was really long. Everybody was frustrated. It was toward the end of the day, and he could hear people complaining to the checkout clerk ahead of him. He could hear voices raised and some really ugly, nasty things were being said. It was holiday time. So when he finally got to the clerk with what he was buying, uh, the lady looked just completely defeated, frazzled, near tears. And she looked at my dad and said, please say something nice. <laughs> and without hesitation, he launched into Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And he said, her face softened. She smiled through her tears. She said, oh, that was beautiful. Is there more? <laughs> and had I been standing there, I said, well, there's a lot more. <laughs> now, my dad didn't know that lady at all. She wasn't part of our church. For all he, he knew, he, she didn't have any idea who Jesus was. But he saw an opportunity for grace. Paul says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Literally, in wisdom, walk toward those outside. Now, by outsiders, it means those who are outside the church family, not yet in the community of the church, those who do not know or understand Jesus or the gospel. That would have been 99% of the people living around the Colossians. There were Gnostics and pagans and Romans and Greeks and those from Jewish background. And at the most, they would have heard a little bit about this new community called the Christian church. They may have heard rumors swirling about these Christians, that they practiced very strange rituals. After all, the Christians talked about eating flesh and drinking blood. Uh, Christians didn't give their devotion to the emperor, uh, but rather to a man they called the Christ. They didn't worship the pagans pagan gods at all. Uh, they were different. They were weird. They were dangerous. Sound familiar at all? 
Paul says, be wise. And I think there are two dangers Paul has in mind. First, there's the danger of becoming like outsiders, sort of assimilating to the life and culture outside, not unlike a student going to college and quickly assimilating to the lifestyle happening on a university campus, or a Christian getting a new job and quickly assimilating into the language or the behaviors or the attitude of that particular office. There are actually churches in our culture today, whole denominations that have tried to become more attractive to outsiders by altering the claims of the New Testament, by altering the gospel itself, by treating the Bible as sort of mythology, uh, by treating the death and resurrection of Jesus as, as inspiring, but just legendary, not historical. Interestingly, those are the churches in our culture that are dying because they've lost their purpose. The second danger I think Paul's talking about is avoiding or condemning outsiders. I got a call in my office uh, years ago from a man I did not know. He identified himself as a recovering alcoholic, and he said to me, um, Pastor, I just want to know if I can come to your church. I said, well, first of all, it's not my church. And second of all, of course you can come. Why do you ask? And he said, his voice actually broke, and he said, well, I relapsed recently, and the church I was going to told me not to come back. Paul says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. He's saying, pay attention. Life is short. Paul was very aware that the end of his life may have been coming. He knew he didn't have a lot of time left. That's true for all of us. Time is short. You never know when the opportunity for spiritual influence will, will come up. Maybe you're in the checkout line. Maybe you're getting your coffee. Make the most of the opportunities, he says. And finally, verse 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Every now and then, someone will ask me something like this. Uh, how can I be more effective, more influential for Jesus um, where I work or in my neighborhood or at school? How can I be more effective? Well, Paul has a very simple encouragement here. He's just saying, live on mission. To live on mission, he says, we need two things in our bag, grace and salt. We are to be graceful and we are to be salty. Here's a question. What would you guess, what would you say is the cultural narrative about Christians in our culture. Another, what, someone driving by this campus today on the road uh, sees all the cars in the parking lot. What are they assuming we're about in here? Well, here's what I think many think. They think we are uh, sort of collectively narrow-minded. Uh, they think we are probably both ignorant and arrogant. Bad combination. They think we're hopelessly out of touch with the real world. They even might think that we sort of hate those who don't agree with us. I think that's the narrative. How do we change that narrative? Paul says grace. Grace. Think about our world today. Think about our culture. Think about social media right now. I think I can make an argument that we live in a graceless culture. A shocking lack of grace. The word grace means gift, undeserved favor, and it's at the heart of the gospel. So when we are graceful, when we treat people with respect and care and compassion, we change the narrative and we introduce them to the grace of Jesus. So what's salt? What does he mean by salt? I think by salt, Paul means the truth of the gospel. That in Jesus we find new hearts, new identity, new purpose, and new destiny. Paul uses the word salt because salt adds flavor, because salt in the ancient world was a preservative from corruption, and because salt makes people thirsty. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. Paul assumes that if we are full of grace, if we sprinkle our conversations with the seasoning of salt and truth, people will ask questions, and then we can answer. Many of you have heard the name Lee Strobel. Um, he's a well-known pastor, speaker, author. He writ has written a bunch of books. One of his books, The Case for Christ, recently was made into a movie. Um, but before he became a follower of Jesus, Lee Strobel was a newspaper reporter for the Chicago Tribune. 
a hard driving, aggressive, uh, self-proclaimed atheist. And I heard him speak years ago and he told sort of the prequel story to his life. That is during the time when he was uh, an aggressive atheist and a newspaper reporter, he had a young coworker who um, let it be known that he was a, a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And Strobel thought that was the craziest thing he'd ever heard, and he despised the guy. And so he went out of his way to make life for this young guy um, unbearable. Uh, made fun of him, criticized him, gave him lousy assignments, just made his life uh, generally miserable. And he did it for fun. Well, um, I think it was uh, Strobel's wife had a difficult pregnancy, some dangerous things were going on, and the only person in the whole office who called to offer support was that guy that he had been abusing in work. This young guy called him and just said, Mr. Strobel, I wanted you to know that my wife and I are praying for your wife and your baby. That was it. That's all he said. Strobel was shocked at that phone call and later said that that was the first person in his life who moved him toward the God he did not yet believe in. We say every week that we want people to experience grace grow in faith, and make an impact where you are. I think Paul would agree. And more than that, I think he would love that we say that because that's what he was trying to say because that's why we're here. So the last two bits of instruction he gives to these people in Colossae, 2,000 years ago he gives to us today. The last two things, pray on purpose and live on mission. Let's bow as we close. Lord, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for this ancient letter that is really so contemporary. Thank you for reminding us of the power of prayer, the encouragement not to give up. Thank you for reminding us of the power and impact of a life lived on mission. May we be people filled with grace, people that live lives seasoned with salt. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.